In 2021, The Impossible happened. An adult Filipino comic series got an animated series adaptation with a majority Filipino cast and crew. The story wasn't too far removed from reality. In fact, the story itself is based entirely in Metro Manila and is heavily inspired by lower Filipino mythologies. There was no romance, minimal humor, and it only got one celebrity actor casted in it. That's right, today we're talking about Trece. Trece, for the uninitiated, is a comic series written by Budget Tan and illustrated by Kajo Baldissimo, published in 2005 and, 16 years later, received a Netflix animated series adaptation produced by Base Entertainment, a Singapore-based production studio that only makes Indonesian series. We'll come back to how it was produced later on. It was written for the screen by Jay Oliva, Zigmar Sigan, Mick Vergara, and Tanya Yuzun, and animated by California-based studio Lex and Otis, and South Korean-based studio Tiger Animation, with episodes directed by Jay Oliva, Tim Divar, David Hartman, and Mel Zwyer. Okay, fine, jeez. Teresa itself is a sort of magical realistic procedural what done it within a Swan of the Week format. Well, what counts as in a Swan of the Week format for a six episode series? Alexandra Teresa is called upon by Capitan Guerrero of the Metro Manila Police Department to solve paranormal crimes around the city that the police can't handle. She's usually flanked by these two dudes who are actually Kambal demigods named after Jose Rizal's iconic brothers from Noli Mitangare. Crispin and Basilio. I am not about to start ranting about Noli and Delfili, but know that I only say they're iconic because every August someone pretends to be their mother and calls out for them. And before everyone in the comment section says I have a bone to pick with this show for no reason, I want to point out that I am Filipino. The fact that the series exists fills me with unbridled joy and pride, and I feel like this should open the gateway for more original stories about our lives to hit local screens. But as all things are, it's not without its criticisms, and that will be my sole focus. I'll be going deep and discussing my feelings about the writing and producing of the story itself. Spoilers ahead for the following media, but especially the animated version of Trece. And if any fans of the comic come after me, if you want to school me, just supply me with the entire series. Every volume. I would love to have read it, but I definitely, absolutely do not have that kind of cash. Let's start with the summary. The show ran for six episodes and encompasses about three volumes of the comics at time of writing and recording. Alexandra, Trece, Crispin, and Basilio. And for that one episode. Go around Manila solving all kinds of cases related specifically to what's specified as crimes done or in relation with the underworld. Kind of inaccurate to call it the underworld considering there was only one death deity and they didn't even show up, just their psychopomp. A swang and spirits known primarily as the Karitan run in gangs and clans around Manila in a very hacienda based system. Which is funny because there were no haciendas in Manila but I digress. And the entire Trece bloodline functions primarily as the Aswang Crimes Division with the right to mythic violence. So just like regular Manila cops, I guess. Until you get to later on in the show and they basically say that the Karitan held an uprising against the Trece line specifically because of a prophecy where Alex or Sina eventually leads the world to ruin. A plot point that's kind of just brought up in the middle of the Hambal's very odd bio dad situation where they essentially are enticed to ruin and destroy everything if they're not in touch enough with their human side. Alex is added to this fiasco for some reason. Seniority rules maybe? I don't know. <laughs> There's a politician who's actually a mangkakula making deals with the Aswang to gain more political power. There's a unicorn and there's this little dude who is literally on no one's side except Choknat. Understandable no not though as someone lactose intolerant and hates nuts. I don't think I can share the enthusiasm. And that's pretty much it for the first three volumes, Esther. The first season. Fingers crossed they get another season because God knows this was all set up and little payoff. <laughs> Which brings me to my first criticism, the writing. Now, not everything needs to follow story conventions, yada yada, but if you've seen my video on The Haunting of Hill House, this is basically it. If not, well, for the most part, Tan and Baldissimo didn't 
actually plan for this comic book series to be serialized. In a lengthy interview with Hawker's Magazine back in 2017, Dan explicitly confirmed that his and Baldissimo's goals were aligned with Warren Ellis' beliefs about comic book writing. And if this person doesn't pick up any other issue from your comic book, then it would have been a great experience for him. Much like holding a grenade and having it explode in your hands. So we structured dresses so that each issue, or like at least these days, it's like each volume. If it's your first time, even if you pick up book 6 of Trece for the first time, it would actually be easy for you to understand what's happening in this world. And great, of course, if you get to read the whole thing so you'd have a better understanding of everything. In short, in true comic book form, Tresa is a series of anthologies with only a vague through line. It's about an aswang fighting detective named Alexandra Tresa. Dan even admits to this in the Tresa After Dark special. It's inspired by the Twilight Zone, Batman, John Constantine, and a bunch of comic book writers like Warren Ellis, as mentioned, and Alan Moore. All anthological, except maybe for Moore, who Dan was especially inspired by because of his genre-bending writing for Watchmen. So, there's your confirmation. Marasigan, Oliva Vergara, and Yuzon had the very difficult job of turning an anthology detective story into something more serialized by piecing together crumbs of serialization that honestly would have worked better if they stayed crumbs. In the After Dark special, I especially disagree with Marasigan and Vergara's insistence that film and serials require build-up to accommodate with how fluid time feels on page. We've seen editors and directors like Satoshi Kon toy with how many frames it takes to present and process information uniquely. The passage of time is also a lot easier with the use of color, something the comics didn't have. I'm not really just saying this because I have high standards. No, I do. This six episode series took three years to make, and it was distributed between like four studios and four writers remotely. The fact that the pacing is passable is a statement to their communication skills. I mean, Singapore, South Korea, Indonesia, the Philippines, and California, only two of those places are in the same time zone. And only one of them isn't even a full country, but has its own time zone. I don't understand how America is just one I'm saying this because they only had four lead writers. The writer's room was small, and they had the means to speak with Tan and Baldissimo. And they still managed to not be able to nail down the structure of the screenplay. Is that so much to ask for? Like, it had its ups and downs. Anton's influence on Alex being a big factor into how they serialized this was a pretty alright decision. His death and the consequences of his actions is a direct lead into the reason Alex even sticks her guns in replacing him. His inclusion in the story at all, apart from being the narrative exposition source outside of that hotel at Puto, is what all ties together Alex and the Kambal and the rest of the cast of characters they introduce. But in execution, it's a little wonky. Alex is prophesied and essentially pigeonholed into becoming the Babaylan Mandirigma. Despite like all four of her older brothers, and in making her want to commit to the role, there's a lot less to her character that would warrant the scrutiny of Anton's filicide. Why question his intentions at all if Alex's role as Babaylan Mandirigma is something she narratively had no other choice in? It's not like she can quit and let Manila die for even one night. She's capable of keeping up the work. She has to play keep up with the Karitan and make sure everything's in ship shape. That's her role as a spiritual leader. Here's one. One of Tan's inspiration for the series was Batman, and coincidentally, Telltale ran a Batman series with the same-ish conflict back in 2016. Bruce Wayne had a father who did the wrong thing back when he was alive, and Bruce and the rest of Gotham had to find out posthumously from the worst possible source, one of the biggest mob bosses in the city, while he was getting apprehended by the Batman himself. And Bruce deals with this by... He doesn't. Actually, the whole story goes out of its way to show everyone how incredibly out of his hands this fact is. He gets fired from his CEO position on his own inherited company so the company can save face, thus almost losing Batman. He almost loses his mansion. So basically he lost nothing, really. <laughs> And after a shit ton of other morally ambiguous decisions later, you have to decide whether or not him staying the Batman is actually a good thing, be the hero Gotham never wanted, or if he should just quit the job for the thing he was using vigilantism as a coping mechanism for anyway, keeping his family safe. In this case, Alfred. You can see where I'm going with this, right? Oh, here's another. 
In the Avatar The Last Airbender, Aang is chosen to be the Avatar, the one person who can bend all elements and coincidentally is the bridge between the spirit world and humanity. Monk Yatso, one of the monks in charge of raising him, was of the belief that he should be able to experience a fulfilling childhood instead of being shoved into his role as Avatar at six years old. <laughs> at six years old. When the news gets to him that he has to start training to be the Avatar, he runs away from the destiny he was born into and has no choice in. And he goes all three books trying to get over his hangups of becoming the Avatar, the violence included in winning the war against the Fire Nation, the toll it's taken on him after he's lost his people. He's motivated into the role due to a number of factors, a big one being his chosen family. So let's see these facts. Bruce Wayne became the Batman because he didn't want any other criminals making more orphans, because he wants to make it so people don't have to hurt other people for basic essentials. And putting his father under scrutiny becomes the antithesis of the catalyst of his vigilantism. The entire concept of Batman becomes suspect and essentially makes you question if Batman is just a product of some rich guy refusing to pay for a grief counselor or if he's necessary for Gotham. Aang was forced into a role he never wanted at a young age because he's destined to restore the balance between all four elements and nations. Despite losing everything in the process, it didn't dishearten him. He pushed forward and accepted the role as the responsibility it is, and as the one thing that will inevitably save everyone he loves. Alexander Tese became the Babaylan Mandirigma because it's her family's duty to bridge the worlds between humans and spirits, and in doing so, upholds the balance between both. Putting her father under scrutiny for killing her twin to uphold this legacy does nothing. Alex still chooses to be Babaylan Mandirigma without any prior motivation or conflict with the role. For some odd reason, she still uses family to motivate her away from something she wasn't even considering in the first place. Overall, between the flashbacks to the massacre that brought them the Kambal, Alex's hesitation to oblige them due to her moral compass, and the clashing sentiments among the council make the reveal about Sinag and Alex dry and makes her sudden boost of power and whole thing about how Crispin and Basilio are family a little out of place in the whole season. You didn't even get hints of her liking them until maybe the end of the fight against Santa Maria and Nuno, and that's kind of pushing it. And the way they delivered the reveal would be funny if it weren't so tragically rushed. The Lagbosao straight up monologues for so long, the sun sets in the scene. To be completely fair to them, this is a six episode series that was three entire volumes worth of exposition, some of which they used creative liberties on, and a shit ton of shonen anime have done this before. That doesn't make any of these shows free of criticisms though, and <laughs> honestly, considering the font of inspiration Tan took from, I'd be remiss in saying I'm not a little disappointed that Yusin didn't plan ahead by herself before Netflix picked this up for production. She's been waiting to turn this into a series since 2009. Which brings me to my next point, the production. Tanya Yusin picked up the comics back in 2009 and approached multiple local studios for a series adaptation. She was aiming for a live action, of course, and it was only until 2018 that Netflix picked it up because, according to Miss Yusun, they were looking for anime outside of Japan. Lex and Otis was brought in by Netflix to animate the show when Yusun couldn't find any animation studios locally. And that interests me. <laughs> if Base Entertainment had Netflix's budget to produce Trese, were they forced to pick a studio with a Netflix deal already, or were local studios just not considered? Were the local studios they approach even interested in producing an animated series, or did they just approach the mainstream ones so that they could easily find people to cast and got turned down? Of the production list, none of the animation studios in charge of producing the show were in the Philippines. I know the art director himself is Filipino as well as all of the writers involved, and it's certainly not out of pocket to assume that there were Filipino animators in Tiger Animation, despite the fact that the majority of the animation directors were South Korean. Not even ABS-CBN was digging for this information when the series came out, and there's certainly nothing in the credits that would suggest otherwise. It's just so odd to me that Base chose to, or let Lex and Otis, outsource to a South Korean studio instead. Yusun would know that it's not like Philippine studios are incapable of doing the work they gave to Tiger Animation. 
Hollywood has done it tons of times before. Disney did it with almost all of its 2D animated films. DreamWorks did it with shows like She-Ra and Voltron and a whole host of works credited but mostly ignored in favor of the studios credited in producing it. So what's so different with Yusun and Netflix outsourcing here for Trece? Honestly, at this point, I don't think that's going to get an answer. But it's certainly worth looking into by people with better access to this information than me. I'd ask local indie studios myself, but I'm a video essayist, not a journalist. <laughs> I just had to look at this at another angle because on the production side of Trece, they get a lot of flack for casting a celebrity for clout. Locally, I mean. Everyone and their mother has said what needs to be said about Soberano's voice acting for the Tagalog dub. <laughs> Though for some reason they ignore the fact that in the English dub, Anton was voiced by some random white guy instead of a Filipino actor. I can't name the exact cause of this backlash against a celebrity actor whose casting is actually the fault of the studio producing the series, but for some reason, the vitriol is just not equal. I'm not saying the backlash from comic fans is like, I can excuse racism, but I draw the line at casting a mainstream celebrity actor instead of a seasoned voice actor to the role of what's not even an original dub to the role they're in. But I'm saying that if you're gonna be mad at anyone, be mad at the studio that chose Soberano to be the voice of Alex. Please. And speaking of backlash, the reception. I'm really sectioning these off like Wikipedia articles. <laughs> the most well-known thing about Trece was its marketing. The ads, the sneaks, the fact that they got up Dharma down to hold off on releasing Paage on Spotify for so long. Yes, I am still mad about that. But that's for the pre-release and I'm actually gonna be bending my own rules here for a second because I swore I'd only do heavy fandom culture analyses every two videos but I am Filipino, this is Filipino, and also this is my channel and what I say goes. There are two things I want to touch on with the reception to Tresa the anime and they all stem from the genuine desire to learn new things. After the series came out, there was a sudden onslaught of local and diasporic interest in all things Lower Philippine mythologies. And as any online scholar with only the budget for data plans and siphoning Wi-Fi from nearby cafes would know, the one open access source you can get of anything about Lower Philippine mythologies is through the Aswang project. Now if you're in the know, you've already shaken your head in disapproval. For the blessedly ignorant, let me give you the rundown. The Aswang Project is run by one Jordan Clark, a hobbyist from Canada who started this project in 2006. Currently, the site boasts the title of being a free resource for Philippine mythology. Now, I'm mentioning Clark and his project because in the aftermath of Trece, people began realizing that Jordan Clark was white. And a majority of the people in the diaspora, as well as thrown along and perpetually online locals, took offense to the fact that a white man from Canada has a genuine interest in our mythologies. I understand their concerns. As someone who was deep in academia about a year ago, there is the pressing concern that a majority of studies about our country come from white scholars with a very patronizing academic tone in their writing. It's genuinely frustrating. I'd understand the vitriol for Clark and the project too if it weren't for the fact that most, if not all, of his articles have a list of sources from Filipino scholars at the bottom. Some even link directly to the studies they come from. In fact, the website goes out of its way to tell you, the reader, to email them for their sources should you need the entire studies they use. <laughs> now this one's funny. This person goes out of their way to point out that Clark funded an entire English translation of Ferdinand Blumentritt's work. Now, I don't know if this person is aware that Ferdinand Blumentritt is a trusted historical source or that he was best friends with Jose fucking Rizal, but if they got mad at Clark for providing scholars another source, then that's the hill they're dying on, I guess. We'll just completely ignore that Clark is not only a hobbyist, but is also doing this for his kid, who is half Filipino. We can applaud Rick Riordan for making Western mythologies accessible to neurodiverse children, but condemn Clark for wanting to give his kid something to relate to that he's actually genuinely interested in. Sure. Alright. And in the backlash with the project comes the very source of wanting to learn about Philippine mythologies itself, really. And this is where I tread directly into just my opinion on everything because this is in response to not just the reception of the show, but of the story of Trece itself. 
I'm aware this is probably going to be my reading of it, but the way that the karitan is framed feels disrespectful and exoticizing in its own right. Noir crime fiction and the general vibe it goes for was made in the midst of post-World War II disillusionment. That's why you get detectives who are almost always battling against the corrupt and unjust system. Why, at the end of the day, they remain dissatisfied with their successful cases. Something something monologue, something something alcohol problems, the usual post-war shit. Racism included. And it's understandable that Tan and Baldissimo came up with the comic around 2004 and 2005. The Philippines was, as it always is, in a time of crisis. The Hacienda Luisita massacre, Makabagal Arroyo getting re-elected, countless calamities due to typhoons and flood that frequent the archipelago come summer. It's a wonder a lot of Philippine media isn't always in a state of disillusionment with its unjust systems. But there weren't real statements made about the state of things in real life on page. That I know of, at least. Unlike the show, which has an extensive episode dedicated to a paltry and barely passable commentary on the drug wars. No, in the comics, it was just the general noir crime fiction vibe of corrupt politicians, femme fatale TV celebrities, and out-of-touch people in positions of power. I guess that's because it's based on Batman and John Constantine. And it's in this genre setting that makes me highly uncomfortable with the use of lower Philippine mythologies in what's a very western idea of law and order that Metro Manila has already adapted to. Never mind the fact that um, our mythologies were put in the horror genre. <laughs> this is normal for us. For some reason, it's horrific to other countries. Whatever. It essentially exoticizes the cultures of old, of pre-colony, and even just cultures of indigenous peoples that still exist to this day, barely acknowledged by the general public if it's not put under the fiction section of a bookstore or library. The words, actions, and customs far removed from their original context end up becoming criminal in the show and comics. It makes the action of a trickster into a crime for doing what's customary for a tikpalang who's been challenged. It's disrespecting a deity for trying to avenge the murder of his son when they were just doing what's customary for a deity being worshipped and sacrificed to. It's equating a swung incident's usually negative consequences to bad societal conduct with organ and human trafficking. And I get that fictionally in the story, Babaylan Mandirigma are an actual thing. That in this reality, all the epics are true, hell maybe even Darna is real, but Babaylan are spiritual leaders in charge of advising a community how to behave around the already existing and vastly older societies of the spirits around them. They're not cops with the right to mythic violence. Having the Trece line and the Babaylan Mandirigma be in touch with modern-day Metro Manila's laws while dealing with the supposedly backwards-thinking Karitan, who have existed since before the Trece line was even a passing sperm in someone's balls, smells very much like colonialist thinking to me. And the fact that the show was distributed internationally makes this a lot more uncomfortable for me. Because our ways of living and the cultures of indigenous peoples and customs of pre-colonial Philippine tribes become a spectacle on a global scale, and it's misconstrued for the sake of fictional fun. It's a good thing I already brought him up, because the same thing happened with Rick Riordan, fictionalizing and mythologizing what's an actual, real, still existing form of worship and culture. And it's not that the production appropriated and exoticized indigenous cultures on purpose. There is such a thing as a correct way of portraying indigenous cultures for the sake of fiction. And it's usually through consulting with and compensating them for the work of educating you and giving them due credit for their work. I'd like to pull back to what I said in the beginning and just... I really would have appreciated this show if it had been released locally first. Hell, if the intended audience had been the people Tan and Baldissimo had made the comic for. If the series had been released for locals before sending it careening into the global stage, it would still feel a little exoticizing, but at the very least, it's just your regular degular Imperial Manila with its majority Catholic standard of mystifying indigenous people's cultures and beliefs. Because making it specifically for an international audience just makes it feel like all the little homages to Filipino culture call it Manila culture. were put there just for foreigners to gawk at. I mean, Oliva even admits that after hearing about how the MRT breaks down sometimes, he thought it would be a neat way to open the show. Our lives and the lives of our indigenous peoples shouldn't have to be consumable and commodifiable in order to be written about or to even be relevant. 
We don't have to have an anime about our lives and mythologies made by other people for foreigners to relate to us. Hell, we don't even need foreigners to relate to us. We want to tell our stories to be seen, to be related to by people like us. By our people. And that starts with making these stories ourselves. With writing stories that would help our people. Final thoughts. Teresa is an alright story. It's a fictional interpretation of Metro Manila where there are actually still Encanto and Aswan. It's a story about family and family history, about crime, about Manila. And it's a pretty entertaining romp if you just want to read or watch something for a while. But nothing is without its criticisms. Some of which I didn't even get to say, like the very evident colorism in the show, the caricaturistic designs they gave the villains, the casual objectifying shots of women, the complete lack of involvement with victims' loved ones you usually see in noir fiction, and, since we're talking about the noir fiction, the oddly abundant amount of police propaganda. Like, come on guys, the BNP and AFP didn't pay you to put this in there, right? Right? But overall, the animated series is completely unremarkable. I'm assuming Netflix gave them the whole you can have X amount of runtime deal like they did with Mike Flanagan and Hill House's 10 fucking hours. Why would you give an anime a 6 episode run? Like, have you ever seen an anime? A single run is usually around 10 to 12 episodes. But I digress. The more I speak of it, the higher the chances of me getting assassinated by Netflix. For legal reasons, this is a joke. Maybe in the next season they'll get more than 6 episodes. They'll have a better time pacing the case files into a coherent narrative, and they'll actually get a Filipino studio to animate the Filipino anime. Special thinking. Thank you so much for getting this far. Special thanks again to Gab for helping me narrow down some details and for answering my endless amount of questions. Shout out to Jeanette for being a real one, and if you like this, Tell me how much. In fact, tell me your favorite parts of the show. Like the video if you want, subscribe for more, and if you ever want to support me further than the engagement on the video, you can follow me everywhere through the card down below and through my Patreon and Ko-fi. Stay safe. Ingat tayong lahat. Bye!